be having the, the second keynote speech for the day and the fourth uh, since the start of the festival. Um, the keynote speaker at present is uh, Mr. Nada Shabut, uh, the paper goes to the future past, the right yard in a state of suspension. Uh, professor Shabut is an associate professor of art history and the director of uh, the Contemporary Arab and Muslim Studies Institute at the University of North Texas, the United States. She's a former member of the Board of Governors of the Cultural Development Center of the Qatar Foundation, head of research and advisor at Maha, Arab Museum of Modern Art in Doha. She's uh, the author of uh, Modern Arab Art, Formation of Arab Aesthetics, um, and the co-editor of the new vision, Arab Art in the 21st Century, and as well as the founding president of the Association for Modern and Contemporary Art in the Arab World, Iran and Turkey. She has published widely on modern and contemporary art art and on the relationship of identity and visual representations. She is the founder and project director of the Modern Art Iraq Archive, which documents and digitizes modern Iraqi heritage. Which there are words among its authors, <laughs> include the Tar uh, Fellow 2006 and 2007, the MIT, she was at MIT visiting assistant professor in spring 2008, and Fulbright Senior Scholar uh, Program. Now, I mean, just for reading the abstract, I don't know if you did, uh, I mean, if there was ever a topic relevant for ex colonies uh, as much as Iraq was, and Cyprus, I think uh, uh, this is really it. And uh, for that matter, I would like to thank you for coming and uh, uh, ask you to give me a Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you very much all for being here after a quick lunch. And um, thank you, Janis and Helen, for inviting me and for um, organizing this very interesting um, uh, conference. I've so far very much enjoyed it, and I look forward to the rest of it. Um, I should tell you that generally, when I am invited to talk about Iraq, and, and I'm reminded um, by um, you know, uh, Professor Spivak's uh, uh, comments yesterday that you know I am not only Iraqi, and as a matter of fact, it was really interesting that in the uh, uh, catalog, it says I, Q, and USA. I'm not sure exactly what the, I, I think I is Iraqi, Q is Qatar, and, and, uh, and US is uh, US. And so, but today I will be an Iraqi representative, uh, uh, representative, I suppose. But I also should warn you that when people ask me to talk about Iraq, I have so much to say that I ended up with a very, very long talk that I kept on cutting down. And now I'm going to overwhelm you between images and talk, and hopefully you get some image out of you, some um, uh, narrative or some ideas out of it. OK. <clears throat> Cultures, as epistemological projects, as Vivek argued yesterday, are in a state of constant change. This is a fact. Their transformation reflect not only growth and evolution, but then, uh, but often severe conditions such as wars, disasters, and conflicts. The same is true for Iraq's culture. The echelon of change and its effects, however, vary in accordance to the cause and that ch of that change. There is certainly much to be said about the destruction of history and heritage in Iraq during the last century. Such a discussion, however, becomes particularly significant to the years of sanctions and following the US-led invasion. The extreme and sudden disintegration of Iraq's cultural institution and structures, which followed the 2003 invasion, have its short and long-term complications. The 2003 US-led invasion promised Iraqis, among other things, democracy, freedom, and a better life. Western media predicted a flourishing in the arts and culture with the assured subsequent freedom of expression. Today, nearing a decade since the promise, Iraqi art and culture are in a state of suspension. For the last decade, the arts, its institutions, and its infrastructure have been dismantled and neglected. State patronage and protection came to a full stop, and mass <coughs> exodus on Iraqi artists caused a decisive rupture in its history of art. Iraqi culture has received ser serious blows and tremendous losses. As defined by Jonathan Crary in Suspensions of Perception, suspension is, I quote, 
The state of being suspended, a looking or listening so rapt that it is an exemption from ordinary conditions, that it becomes suspended tempor <coughs> excuse me, suspended temporality, a hovering out of time. It implies and po the possibility of a fixation of holding something in wonder or contemplation in which the attentive subject is both immobile and ungrounded. But at the same time, a suspension is also a cancellation or an interruption. And I wanted here to indicate a disturbance, even a negation of perception itself." End of quote. <clears throat> Hovering in a continuous state of crisis, emergency, and trauma, Iraqi art exists outside its historical index in a state of exception. Moreover, a web of liminal spaces outside of Iraq has been created propagating parallel Iraqi cultures in exile and diaspora and marking a shift in its historical center of production. It has been argued in the process of decolonization and the creation of a new state and citizen I quote, for a nation to exist, it must have a common vision to enable it to develop internally and externally, with its place among other nations, against them if need be, end of quote. In the period between 1940s and 1960s, Iraqi artists were part of this vision and extended the collective national vision to the visual, the visual language of their arts. Regardless of how we feel about the national or the nation, this is the reality of what was happening in the floor, on the ground. The modern nation state project, as imposed and enforced on the Arab world, however, has demonstrated its ineffectiveness in creating and maintaining a national coherence. That is certainly the rhetoric that surrounded the dismantling of the state of Iraq as it existed in the 20th century. Nevertheless, Iraq faces, faced, faces still a new colonization before having the chance to deal with residues from the Ottoman and British rules, perhaps a failed nation state, let alone wars and deprivations imposed and executed by the world. To give you um, just sort of a quick uh, background, to, and some of the images that I will be showing, you know, sort of work, in, you know, they go in parallel to what I'm saying, but you know, clearly here I'm showing you what used to be in El Ferdos uh, uh, Square, famous, became so famous after the toppling of um, the uh, uh, statue of Saddam Hussein on April 9, 2003, and there has been several interpretations of this specific incident. And then the temporary um, uh, project that kind of actually, when I was in, uh, erected overnight uh, by a group of amateur uh, uh, artists called al Najin, the survivors. Art is no longer appropriately reified as culture, but must be recognized as an elemental discourse within the larger societal construction of knowledge and power, has been argued. The professional art production in Iraq continued, uh, co sorry, constituted an important part of Iraq's visual culture because of its direct connotation and connection to identity and consequently a large part of the nation's collective memory. More importantly, Iraqi artists struggled to construct national Iraqi art structured aesthetics specifically as a site of resistance. The symbiotical relationship between art and culture was necessarily dependent on vigorous connections between a number of important components. There is the reciprocal relationship between works of art and both production and retention. Production of art is the outcome of artists' creativity, education, and economics. Retention, both public and in the form of museums and galleries and private, is connected to patronage and exhibitions. Ultimately, the sum of it all is what constitutes the making of the tradition of art, art history, which in turn arguably reflects continuity, aesthetic value, and creativity. None of this is possible without a stable structure. This structure in Iraq prior to 2003 was completely supported by the government. Thus, the sudden dismantlement of the structure of Iraq without an alternative not only stifled creativity, but allowed for parodies of its art history, largely unwritten locally or regionally due to various inadequacies and, and previously neglected by the canon of art history. Within today's interest in all things Iraqi, 
Western media has taken the liberty to define it and publicize the image it found fit for the world's perception of what Iraqi art should look like. In other words, Western media began inventing a new historical narrative of modern Iraqi art. Hobsbawm tells us that invention of tradition intensifies, I quote, when there are sufficiently large and rapid changes on the demands or supply side, end of quote. Yet one imagines that Hobsbawm's reference is related to an internally produced change. But when the invention is occurring outside of the cultural factors, would it not in the least necessarily include distortion and ideological fabrications? The distortion includes at the recently developed market value courtesy of auction houses. The first Christie's auction to include Arab art was held in Dubai on the 24th of May 2006 under the title Christie's uh, Dubai Sale International Modern and Contemporary Art. Iraqi artists represented in the sale were Shakir Hassan al Said, Suad al Attar, and the Azawi. Prices of the works were initially set at the range of $4,000 to $18,000, but the works were sold for much higher. While the prices these works accrued and the other Iraqi works sold in following auctions are certainly well deserved and constitute a little too late recognition, the problem is in the lack of any permanent system of valuation based on aesthetics or other factors which determines market value for world art. As, as you know, screwed up as that is. In other words, <coughs> it is fully based on an interest fueled by the political situation in Iraq. And I should say here that while yesterday um, in Svedek's lecture, she talked about um, that it is only the local and that most, but I, you know, unfortunately, for most artists of the Arab world, valuation does not happen in the local. Their validation is only seen actually outside of the center of what they can constitute as the local. <coughs> the destruction of Iraqi visual production covered a number of different but connected components, both tangible and non-tangible. The physical part of this destruction includes the actual loss of artwork and devastation of infrastructure. I'll be showing you some of these uh, images as I speak here. Following the 2003 invasion, works of art were the objects of looting and spoil. The collection of the former Saddam Center for the Arts, the Iraqi Museum of Modern Art, has been fully dissipated. About 8,000 works, um, uh, well, about 7,000 works are still at large. Private galleries have become mostly ineffective and important private collections are fast getting fragmented and scattered around the world. Destruction of the infrastructure includes both education and patronage. Iraq's uh, Col Col College of Fine Arts at Baghdad University, formerly the Baghdad Art Academy, and the Institute of Fine Arts in Baghdad were known for the quality of their art education. The first art institute in Baghdad was established in 1941. From its beginning, it was unique in the region insofar that most instructors were Iraqis. As the artists who were sent to study abroad on government scholarships returned, they assumed teaching positions, expanded the institute, and upgraded curricula. It became a favorite for art students and future artists of the Arab world to attend. Many established and accomplished Arab artists around the region, of the previous generations, of course, and were educated in Iraq. Their interaction with Iraqi art faculty and artists further, further disseminated Iraqi art ideals and aesthetics, and in turn widened its sphere of influence on the region. The government of Iraq has traditionally been the main patron of, for artists. Their patronage included free education, sponsorship of exhibitions, and purchases of work of art. Until 2003, the Saddam Center for the Arts served as the official institution for regulating all aspects of the arts. And I want to make sure to point here that I am by no means, in any shape or form, you know, uh, uh, condoning or um, approving of you know, the system that was followed under uh, Saddam Hussein. I'm merely stating um, how the system was operated. The non-tangible destruction is manifest in the form of intellectual and artistic vacancies. 
in Iraq that greatly intensified since 2003. Be it in the inability of artists to produce due to lack of, of material and uh, favorable environment or actual phys physical vacancies resulted from migration of artists. While a number of artists left Iraq seeking better financial opportunities in neighboring countries, at times taking their whole families with them during the 1990s, the displacement of Iraqi artists, as with all Iraqis in general, only increased since 2003. This is actually, uh, you know, I'll keep them up for a little bit because they do have some quotations for you to read um, sometimes. The alarming factor has been the new attitude of permanency developed. During the 1990s, most Iraqis viewed the situation of their displacement as temporary. You know, they would say, until things get better and sanctions were lifted. Now, however, they see no relief on the horizon and most declare art to be unsafe, unlivable, and hopeless. The surge of force in 2007 by the commander of the multinational force in Iraq resulted in further internal displacement. Almost five million, according to the UN um, statistics, now they're about three million and a half. In 2006, the UN estimated that 40% of the middle class had fled. The International Anti-Occupation Network and the Brussels Tribunal compiled a list of 459 academics, academic names detailing their assassinations from 2003 to 2011. Thus, the new wave of migration seeks a permanent home for the future. Numbers of Iraqi initially displaced to Jordan and Syria are estimated for by millions, in millions. The permanency of this wave of migration has been further facilitated by the necessary role of the United Nations in an effort to alleviate misery and insecurities caused by the collapse of Jordan's and, and Syria's infrastructure in the face of the sudden mass increase of population, which in turn resulted in a new unfavorable regulations towards Iraqis. That is, of course, before the situation in, in uh, Syria, uh, the revolts in Syria started. For the most part, the Iraqi government did not acknowledge the mass displacement of Iraqi refugees, but rather viewed it as temporary, what they call guests at their brothers' countries. A rhetoric that left Iraqi refugees without any structure or support. In the last few years, however, the United Nations initiated a new refugees relocation program which started with the designation of the status of refugee to the Iraqis and issuing refugee identity cards to all Iraqis who registered with the goal of relocating them permanently to a number of participant countries in the program. Many uh, Iraqi artists are currently actually in, in uh, uh, the United States and everywhere else. Inside of Iraq, meanwhile, The, the, the progression of the group of the head of Sudan. Inside of Iraq, meanwhile, a new visual culture was formed in vacuum since the invasion and in view of a new social rhetoric of occupation, sectarianism, insecurity, and instability. This new visual culture evolved in discord and denial of Iraq's cultural and art history. What a you know, sad situation of what remains that is not being dismantled uh, in Iraq. As a result, a new generation of amateur Iraqi artists existing outside of the context is developing a new Iraqi visual culture reflective of the art historical void. And I want to show you, uh, you've seen the, the images of, and you clearly, um, destruction didn't just, uh, wasn't just in the museums of the arts, but the libraries, the archives, um, the universities, and everywhere else. Moreover, given the United States ideology as occupiers and promoters of a new Iraq, something the current government inherited, and through uh, particular forms of patronage, these new artists, are advertised as representatives of contemporary Iraqi art and expressive of the new freedom and democracy. Equally troubling, the notion of sectarian art as opposed to national art is developed. There is and will continue to be marked disintegration and deculturation of the national Iraqi identity as it is fragmented and lost outside of Iraq. 
due to assimilation, acculturation, and near depression. A new Iraqi nationalist expression will necessarily develop in exile while the, with the, by the displaced Iraqi artist. Further fragmentation of the notion of an Iraqi national art is exemplified in the number of new exhibitions of Kurdish art, Assyrian art, and so on. As distinctly different than Iraqi art, it has already been, you know, it, there was actually a planet Kurdistan that included mostly Iraqi artists in the Venice Biennale, although there was also an Iraqi pavilion in the Venice Biennale, in the last Venice Biennale and the, and the next one. Okay. The Air Revolts. Despite the Guardian's headlines, uh, Guardian headlines on the uh, on April 25th of 2011 that led Iraq's own Arab Spring, a renewed sense of nationalism is uniting protesters over delays to U.S. Tro uh, uh, troop withdrawal. For Iraq, the euphoria of Arab revolts was very subdued. It is not because Iraqis did not feel the need for change; rather, there were several attempts that aimed to engage and join the regional fervor but they were small in comparison to the rest of the region and certainly not big enough to make a media splash. The popular movement to save Iraq, which has its share of internal strife, strife and problems, led, by the, led the day of rage on February 25th. The movement is headed by Oday Zaidi, whose infamous brother threw the shoe on George Bush, which actually caused him to lose his job at the Ministry of Culture. Demonstrations actually were held in 60 towns and cities across Iraq. They were quickly and violently suppressed by security forces, and all efforts were swiftly smothered by invoking fears of further sectarian unrest. Nevertheless, Iraqi were demonstrating during most of 2011-2012 over multiple issues that are not limited to corruption, insecurity, poor services, unemployment, and political rights. In fact, there were sporadic pro protests since the invasion of 2003. And I'm showing you the um, Tahrir Square um, in Baghdad. However, with the fast disappearance of the middle class, the exodus of intellectual and creative cadre, protests diminished. The level of violence used against any dissent in the period between 2000 and 2007 caused further mass migration to neighboring countries. The return of some families to Iraq following the relative calm of 2008 in search for a better life than the one they endured in exile, along with new generations of discontented and disillusioned youth, established fresh voices of dissent. Thus, the 2011 region's revolt resonated with the Iraqi uh, youth and instigated them to act. At any rate, world media were largely ignored all voices from Iraq, including those from Baghdad Tahrir Square. Not as, you know, as sexy looking as uh, the, you know, Cairo Tahrir Square. Perhaps the world was content that the Middle, that Middle Eastern hope for democracy and change has already reached Iraq, or simply was bored with Iraq. This year again, on February 25th, a protest of around 1,500 people took place in Tahrir Square and was again crushed. I quote, People have good reason to be afraid of protesting in Iraq, said one of the demonstrators. The regime is ready to use all necessary means to suppress dissent, and at the same time, no solidarity from the media means that both mobilization and repression go unnoticed, end of quote. In fact, the demonstrators are convinced that the large number of people who had planned to partake in the demonstrations were strategically scared by the series of explosions that took place around Baghdad days before the organized uh, demonstrations. In fact, uh, Nur and Maliki went on TV and asked people to not go out of their house during that day for demonstrations. Nonetheless, the situation in Iraq is different than the rest of the Arab world. The lesson of the Iraq war, indeed, is that regime change by external interventions blocks aspirations for more democratic and human political systems. But what does this mean? for Iraqi culture and arts. How is dissent informing the arts, and what is the source of inspiration for Iraqi artists today? As Iraq is effectively today divided into at least three major zones, Iraqi culture and arts <coughs> seems to be developing inside in equally three different ways. In the north of Iraq, Kurdistan, 
There are attempts of promoting a distinct visual production that is Kurdish, but also amidst the comparatively better life conditions, security, and construction boom, the northern cities of Iraq have provided spaces of operation for diaspora and international NGO initiatives, such as SADA, ECHO, one of the, the young organizations that were started by young Iraqi women interested in providing aid to contemporary Iraqi artists inside of Iraq, and particularly Baghdad. While Sada has already offered one workshop in Baghdad in 2011, it was forced to move its 2012 workshop to LB in the north for security reasons, particularly as it would be quite difficult, nearly impossible, um, to obtain visas to get the Iraqi students to neighboring countries like Jordan, Syria is, of course, not even a possibility anymore. Kurdistan thus offers the alternative, but Baghdad remains mostly disconnected. In the South, a new culture dictated by religion and Shia rituals is in the making. I have less information about how this is particularly uh, influencing the development of art in southern Iraq. There were earlier attempts in Baghdad by the Southern Party to promote a trend of Shia art by sponsoring competitions around themes such as Karbala and the Martyr de Hussein. But the experiments does not seem to have uh, amounted to much. Najaf was selected as one of the Islamic cultural capital of 2012, but extreme corruption that swindled all funds without producing anything resulted in its elimination and a major scandal. Baghdad is in the middle. It's a quite an interesting zone. Since 2003, the, the arts, as with everything else in the city, were ignored. This presented a reverse of the situation under Saddam, and pretty much since the establishment of the state of Iraq, when Baghdad as the capital was the center of all activities and growth and received the most attention and funding. After 2003, the other provinces fared much better than Baghdad. But I will return to Baghdad later because, you know, quite an interesting development is happening now. First, I would like to talk briefly about the fourth, uh, fourth zone of development. Oh, okay. Um, Iraqi art in diaspora, that is, which itself is a very complex and varied, and I by no means I'm going to, to do justice for it, but I'm just briefly going to talk about a few uh, uh, ex uh, you know, examples. It is united in being mostly disenfranchised along the, with the marginalized Iraqi <coughs> tradition of art making from the development inside. By now, number of Iraqi artists in exile has greatly uh, uh, multiplied. Sorry, I'm not seeing very well. <laughs> um, there is the older generation of Iraqi artists who had left Iraq during the 1990s or before, who established themselves elsewhere in the world, and now they are joined by most of the younger generation of established artists who are currently refugees in various places around the world. The challenges are many, and the ramifications are abundant. On the outset, migrating artists face the personal loss of their status as developed in Iraq through years of work and exhibition. In their new homes, they are unknown. While this is a condition faced by all uh, immigrants, it is multiplied in the case of Iraqi artists because of the lack of any international understanding, recognition, and or valuation of Iraqi art. Iraqi art history is still largely undocumented. There are only few records chronicling art production and listing movements and much less analysis and valuation. With today's much uh, sudden recognition of Iraq's contemporary culture and art production, there is much confusion. The West necessarily has no idea of how or why this is Iraqi art. Journalists and other Western viewers of contemporary Iraqi art are often surprised and disappointed that Iraq's art is not figuratively wearing their perception of what its national identity as a uh, badge. Within the Arab world and in view of the new, albeit limited, value Arab art is acquiring internationally, there is much celebration and less art historical or visual analysis and criticism. There is a profound need in the region to evaluate works of art as objects of aesthetics <coughs> and projects of visual culture not only rejoice in their production. Yeah. Uh, Arabs can make art, Arabs can also make, you know, revolt, apparently. 
In the case of Iraqi art, the lack of a written history marks scholars in efforts to record first and analyze later. Iraqi artists face various factors of survival and acclimation in their new homes, in new, new home countries. In production of their art, they are removed from elements of their daily li Iraqi life and are instead under new influences of globalization, which will lead to assimilation and acculturation. Many of the Iraqi artists who left during the 1990s faced such conditions. Moreover, an important factor in the development of contemporary Iraqi art during the last two decades has been the disjunction caused in the isolation between Iraqi artists who remained in Iraq and those who developed in exile. Their only contact had been the traffic between Iraq and Jordan, which has assumed the role of Iraq's portal to the rest of the world for most of the last three decades, Jordan that is. During the sanctions, this traffic allowed for an occasional and isolated smuggling of an art journal or magazine, and thus provided a detached and decontextualized glimpse of art development elsewhere. The direct effect of such occurrences, <coughs> while under undetermined, could be at least uh, could be at best shallow, hardly an influence, although at times a visual inspiration. This certainly was not the case for Iraqi artists in exile, who had already a uh, who had a steady and free access to new developments in global art, both through and uh, through print and exhibitions. This fact made a discourse of unified Iraqi art, Iraqi art, Iraqi art in Iraq, and that developed in exile absurd. For example, until 2003, and this is a very telling example actually. Iraqi artists inside of Iraq believe that the ultimate progress in form is abstraction, as was understood in the 90s, 1950s and 1960s generation, by the 1950s and 60s generation, and evident in their move from representational to abstraction. It is only quite recently, with a few chances of travel awarded to, uh, to Iraqi artists, allowing them to view global work in many museums, in major museums that is, that they realized postmodernism's abandonment of any self-imposed taboo on representation. This was, in fact, an obvious difference between works of Iraqi artists inside versus those on the outside. Media and technology, of course, is another difference. This belief was shared by Iraqi artists who took refuge in Jordan since 1990s. They resided in a third space that literally existed in between. While they were physically in exile outside of Iraq, they remained emotionally connected with Iraq, and particularly in seeking their support for various reasons, including Jordan's lack of a wide globally developed art scene. Works by Iraqi artists residing in Jordan embodied the Iraqi daily existence without reference to particular details except for ones from memory. You're looking at the work by um, Iraqi artist Nazar Yahya, card of illumination, where he uses his personal experience to negotiate the eminence of the identity card in Iraqi's daily life, as it was particularly during sanction. And in fact, now that they want to revoke and take it away uh, from Iraqis, because you know, it was through this identity card that you actually got supplies, food, and, and so on, there is in fact a, uh, um, quite a discussion, quite a debate inside of Iraq of how Iraqis feel about revoking their identity cards. Um, it was an indicative of an individual's being as an element of identification and as a facilitator of life where one had to produce the card to receive rations during the years of sanctions. The continuous piercing of the card, recording the act of receiving, ultimately obliterates the image, the individual's photo, and thus the individual from being. Iraqi artists who endured years of hardship and deprivation inside of Iraq developed a new relationship with their country and history. Hana Malala, for instance, credited a, a female Iraqi artist, credited their isolation as the reason behind her generation's return to their ancient Mesopotamian heritage, which in her view was not a consequence of nostalgia, but rather, and I quote, a conscious return to the roots made more palpable existentially and creatively by the precarious realities 
that had continued to bear on every aspect of their lives." And the quote. She evaluated this return as the generation's effort to reconcile their con the contradictions it, face it faces in a glorious past and a, a ru ruinous present. This is that's in response to the collection uh, assembled for the exhibition, the Fatter, that I actually curated, contemporary Iraqi uh, book art, that I curated in 2006 in the USA, in which both Nazar Yahya and Hana Malala, and maybe I should show you a work by Hana Malala first, um, who, Nazar Yahya was in Jordan at the time, and Hana Malala in Iraq, and they both, I, I was, uh, was a heroic effort, but I managed to get them both to come to the USA, and, um, you know, in discussion after seeing some of the works, the two argued that the exhibition demonstrated a division in the creative vision that is not based on personal stylistic differences. Instead, they perceived a divide between Iraqi artists who still lived and worked in Iraq and others who worked and lived in exile or diaspora. They believed that Iraqi artists in exile have been acculturated to to and thus have adopted the concerns and experiments of the other, the West, not merely as a result of artistic influence, but as part of circumstances of daily life, of living in where they live. Although Yahya reevaluated this position after seeing the collection of the Fatr in one space and identifying what he evaluated as Iraqi visual harmony, both he and Malala perceived that the exiled artists have abandoned the concept of identity while works by artists who remained in Iraq are centered on notions of identity as expressed through their daily occurrences and events. Works by artists residing in Iraq necessarily tended to be historical records and documents. I'll go back to the work of Karim Rissam. Karim Rissam's work included in the uh, exhibition provided continuous reference to the notion of erasure and replacement. In Baghdad Burning, or Book of Sanctions, he refers to war and occupation. Rassan also addresses the debankification policy that has led to removal of certain monuments and the replacement by others, with others. And the destruction that I was showing you is, is part of that debankification policy. Another new post-invasion phenomenon that Rissan explored is that of individuals expressing thoughts and opinions in the form of graffiti on surfaces in Baghdad, which is erased and replaced by words of another. There was actually sort of continuous dialogue, social dialogue happening, where people come, you know, say something, and someone else comes in and just, just basically scratches it and then says something else. But you actually can follow up the whole, uh, you know, uh, discussion on the wall, where the space of the daftar, daftar is you know, Eric for notebook, um, is transformed into urban walls. Using available materials such as the ready photo album and various techniques of collage and relief, Bissan transformed local icons into pictographs capable of expressing humanity's collective suffering. In 2006, Bissan had to leave Baghdad with his family after receiving threats. While in Syria, and he was in Syria first, now he is in Canada, Rissam felt that it was, he, as he said, and I quote, a very expensive mistake for which I am paying dearly to leave Baghdad. He felt overwhelmed by trying to survive and support his family to even consider art. The lack of support and opportunities to sell quickly led back to depression. Another five minutes, okay, I will rush, okay. Um, Hana Malala, who I mentioned before, I just want to show you um, some of her latest work, actually. Uh, while she is now in London, Hana Malala also had to leave Iraq. Being a woman, a uh, professor, and artist living alone, she uh, was threatened uh, uh, often. So eventually, uh, uh, on a scholars at risk uh, 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 scholarship, she was a uh, fellowship, she was able to relocate to London, where she lives now. She thought it was going to be a very short period and she will return to Iraq when things you know, settle and try to resist even changing. But one can see from early in her work, you know, the notion of memory. Um, you know, her relationship to Iraq was changing into becoming sort of more of a uh, remembrance. So one more word because I went on to... Inside, going back to uh, Baghdad. 
But my colorful tights in Baghdad in 2003, the artist Rashad Salim was hopeful amidst the debris and carnage. He pondered the possibility to reoccupy the sky with our dreams and regain the future with our imagination, he said. In a pre presentation in London at the Aya Gallery's exhibition preview, Expressions of Hope, Iraqi Art, Salim said, despite the depth and intensity of the abom abomination, I felt from the, these, those I met, a weary yet vital and infectious strength, a power even that in my fresh from abroad self took the form of a strange euphoria that I am still in the process of understanding. Happily, with other outsiders who have visited and felt the same sense mix of feelings. A growing group of not so anonymous Iraqi optimists. Well, sort of, as the situation remains miserable, the path highly dangerous, and the optimism have sometimes divergent grounds to, to, the, to base their hope on. End of quote. Other Iraqi uh, artists inside of Iraq shared that cautious optimism as well for a very short while. The optimism faded quickly and resulted in a rapid mutation and then a noticeable void of creativity inside of Iraq. Various stories from inside of Iraq reported of the conditions. So for instance, um, on the smithsonianmagazine.com it said, but as the insurgency grew in intensity, so did prescriptions against secular expression. Liquor stores were torched, women were drenched with acid for not wearing the veil, and art of any kind was declared blasphemous. In July 2005, and I showed you um, the second, uh, third slide, the Najim uh, uh, statue that went up in the Ferdos uh, uh, Square, the main uh, sculptor who worked on that, his name is uh, Hamad. Hamad. Hamad was commissioned by the Baghdad Municipal Council to create a statue that would honor 35 children who were killed in a car bombing. It was destroyed by militants within two months. Though Hamad turned down two more um, such commissions, he began receiving death threats taped to the door of his home. He remained locked indoors for five months before he abandoned Iraq for Syria. He said, they made me a prisoner in my home. So I came here. After a few months, actually, after he sort of ran out of money depleting all, all of his uh, savings, Hamad returned to Baghdad. And within two months, he was killed. Baghdad has been dubbed by many as a, grave, a graveyard for artists. Artists, however, are known to be resilient, despite of or perhaps because of lo lo uh, looming fear from disapproving religious groups. In 2007, a group of artists participated in a in um, a public work program presented as part of a project of beautification works financed by U.S. military. The Iraqi government and aid organizations as part of an often foiled effort to renovate Baghdad as well as improve its security. More art projects will be planned um, for other sites, the program said. This group of artists called them, themselves the Wall Group, Jamati Jidar. And they were painting um, various walls in uh, around Baghdad with, you know, basically cliche uh, images. And they were aware, aware of that. And, but they were paid fifteen dollars a day to do so. And to them, that was a, you know, a, a process of uh, uh, earning money with the hope. As a matter of fact, they had all hope. Let me go. Back. They had all hope that um, eventually, as security uh, uh, and, and the city stabilizes this work will be destroyed. They quite understood that these are not beautifying walls, but rather reinforcing you know, um, walls of, uh, walls of, uh, um, of separation. All right, I'm moving, really moving forward um, to now, since I only have two minutes by now. In the midst of what can only be understood as deliberate campaign of memory destruction and erasure, executed through a program of debacification and denationalization, as a result of a post-invasion rhetoric of sectarianism and within the discourse of division, the current regime seems to initiate a new campaign for an identity reconstruction. There seems to be a renewed interest in state patronage in preparation for Baghdad as the, Arab cap the cultural capital of 2013. It is quite telling 
that the choice of Baghdad as the Arab cultural capital, which marks a decade since its invasion, serves as a wake-up call and a rush to visually rework the ideological change that is argued was this the reason behind the invasion. According to the Iraqi Minister of Culture, his ministry is implementing a grand projects campaign that aims, according to the minister, to reflect Iraq's diversity as well as combat the one-sided act official culture that the Saddam regime promoted. The announcement of these projects is also designed to proclaim the better security conditions of Iraq. He said, we will work to separate culture from politics and make it fully independent as per a new democratic system in Iraq. The plan of the campaign is more inclusive of the rest of Iraq and they planned 14 cultural projects in Baghdad and 16 other projects around other provinces. For Baghdad, one of these projects is an Iraqi opera house, which the Ministry of Culture declared will be the largest of its kind in the region. They were very ambitious when they first announced the project in January 2011 and invited Zahadi to consider designing the 78,000 square meters overlooking the Tigris. However, they opted for a Turkish company instead, who in May 2012 promised that the building would be ready in 18 months. In Baghdad, there are plans to erect 19 public works and monuments throughout the city. They are to portray various pre-Saddam or pre baghdad personalities, um, and there are various competitions for artists to participate in these works. Capitalizing on current Iraqi sentiments and the rise of nostalgia to the Karim Qasim era. Uh, okay. I'm sorry, okay. Um, the Karim Qasim era, and in an effort to reconstruct the memory of that period, the State Board of Iraqi Antiquity and Heritage organized an exhibition in one of the National Museum's halls showcasing personal belongings of the former leader on the, on the 51st anniversary of the 1958 revolution that established the foundation of the Iraqi Republic. Nevertheless, despite the announcement of these ambitious plans and despite large sums of allocated funds, no efforts were proclaimed to address cultural destruction. There is no discussion about uh, updating cultural policy or reviving <coughs> cultural institutions. And most importantly, at least for me, there is still no official Iraqi entity in charge of locating and stopping the trafficking of looted works from the National Museum of Modern Art. Thus, the collection of the museum is still at large. I suppose one should be grateful that this campaign intends to remove certain monuments perceived as offensive, like this one, offending um, uh, two museums instead of destroying them as has been the practice since 2003. Among a number, the Shaheed monument that you are seeing, although designed by the renowned Smail Fattah, its iconography displays no reference to the Ba, other than, a, of course, commemorating the Iraq-Iran war. The announcement said that the committee asked the general commander of the armed forces to clear the site of the armed uh, forces martyrs uh, monument to comply with the directive approved by the prime minister to transfer this monument to a museum housing relics from the former regime. Um, concluding, it is interesting that despite talks after 2003 about privatization of cultural institutions like museums and visual art production, it seems that the selection of Baghdad as the Arab cultural capital 2013 has reinstituted state patronage and instigated yet another campaign to reconstruct an Iraqi identity. This time, specifically devoid of the Ba'ath era, which is not so different than, that, than what Saddam did when he shaped the country to only glorify him. The systematic destruction of identity and memory erasure of the modern state of Iraq that ensued since the invasion, geared specifically of the debathification of Iraq, resulted in various historiographical voids. Meanwhile, Within this discourse, modern Iraqi art and its institution seem to waver between being good ideas or happy memories nostalgically shared on YouTube and Facebook. Thank you. We were trying to let you see the images. Uh, you seeing the images were more important than me seeing my words, so I apologize for, you know, 
Nada, can you tell us what happened in Mutanabi Street? And Mutanabi Street actually was bulldozed overnight without notice because apparently they were removing violations. But actually also there are plans to have an animal market there. Kind of like the ones they have in, um, in the Gulf, like in Doha, if you've ever been to Doha, there are animal markets that have pink and, and, uh, and green uh, you know, uh, uh, rabbits and, and chicks. So. Well, wasn't there bombs placed there? That was long ago. They had rebuilt since. It was bombed uh, before, yes. But this is actually, this is 2011. Um, so this is this, you know, just recently. Um, actually, in, in, twi in, in, uh, in 2012, as a matter of fact. What year are we in? 2012. It was, it's 2012. I meant to say 2012 here. In 2012, they, uh, just about a month ago, they bulldozed uh, many of these, uh, you know, it's traditionally what the street in Baghdad with booksellers on the streets. And it goes back to the Arab camp, right? you know, historically. Oh, well, by my name. And if there is the Abbasid, uh, you know, uh, uh, buildings there, but they were severely looted as well and dismantled, you know, much of, much of these buildings. You know, um, in 2003, um, it was very interesting to be in Baghdad because I actually literally myself saw the door, and it's a huge, big, heavy door of the Abbasid Kishla, actually, where, where the monarchy even had uh, their offices, was being sold on the street around the corner. Yes, if you may use the microphone or somewhere there, because we, you know, many people can hear the question afterwards. Okay, I think I, I, I lost, like, two minutes or five minutes from your beginning. Did you talk at all about the archaeological museum? I mean, the looting of that would, would have been the first one, wouldn't it? I mean, in, in dismantling the culture of Iraq. Uh, in that you know, this is, I mean, thank you for, for, for bringing this, this point to the discussion, because actually, you know, since 2003 till today, my major struggle has been convincing people that there isn't a museum of modern Iraqi art, that there, you know, there's a modern culture as well. Because leading to the invasion of Iraq, Iraq was very much uh, presented as you know the, the the cradle of civilization. So it is about you know ancient civilization. Uh, there was no reference ever to a contemporary culture. And it's true, the, you know, the ancient museum and the archaeological sites are important and they are in big jeopardy. Although the, the National Museum you know, sort of was in a better situation, many archaeologists around the world um, worked in certain excavations, so they actually had records, and it was in a better shape to start with. Because during the sanctions, um, the, the uh, Iraqi Museum of Modern Art had no support whatsoever. It was actually quite a, a, an interesting situation for Iraqi artists who all of a sudden could develop a private art market that was not allowed under Saddam. But that also meant that they lost the system you know, that was being developed. But also the lack of modern art historians who are interested in working with the museum meant that the ancient, uh, the archaeology and, and uh, uh, ancient museum of uh, antiquity had a better system. Uh, people knew more what, what was there. And they had Donnie George, the late Donnie George, who pretty much, you know, uh, protected the museum, you know, um, until he was forced to leave. And while, yes, you know, Babylon, you know, is, is devastated by the, the, the base being there and the archaeological sites are looted and, uh, you know, and it's still, you know, up till today is a major uh, concern. I'm often annoyed by the fact that no one seems to care about the Iraqi Museum of Modern Art. To me, it was very ideological because acknowledging that there is an Iraqi Museum of Modern Art, that there, are, there, there is modernism in Iraq, and a contemporary culture means that there are people that we have to deal with as opposed to let's go save the civilization and bring them democracy as well. 
basically my point was that you know if, if you take the roots of a civilization, then it's easier to do what you're saying. Sure. In the sense of like uh, you know you leave it like kind of like uh, up in the air. Yes. Because you take everything that it came from. Well, and, I mean, and I think you know the modern and the old. It has a certain continuity. And this is what I'm saying, basically. Which that is, is very important. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. As a matter of fact, by not uh, including the modern in the uh, discourse of, of destruction or you know, the discussion about it, meant that it, 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 it perceived no continuity. That the ancient was there, you know, it's, it's our heritage, humanity's heritage, not the Iraqi people's heritage, and so we can save it. And, you know, it's a, it's a very colonial rhetoric, as a matter of fact. No. I mean, I can hear you. Okay. Well, I just wanted to ask you um, again uh, the same question that this lady just posed to you, because I think it's um, uh, there is no comparison between the modern and antiquity. I mean, can you imagine if they came to Greece and destroyed the archaeological museum? Or the modern art museum, of course, the destruction would have been uh, enormous if it was the archaeological museum, because as this lady of an analysis just said, it's um, uh, he destroyed the actual roots and and uh, and uh, uh, the roots of a particular uh, civilization. Um, I wanted to ask you if you do know uh, to what extent uh, was the uh, a museum looted. To what extent was it destroyed, and can you reclaim or repair what they have destroyed? Which museum? Always the archaeological. This is what we know in the West. Okay. okay. But, but you know, should I? Can I just point out that in a thousand years, the modern era will be ancient too, and we'll be the root of some civilization. So it is. It is history in the making. You know, it's not saying which one is more important. They are both and all important. And in fact, between the ancient and the modern, there's the Islamic that is also completely ignored in Iraq, because that is even a whole different story. So it is, you know, it's definitely not a matter of comparing which one is more important. But the reality is that my, you know, my concern is that, you know, in general, you know, there is some concern about the of integrity. People know it and care about it. But the modern is completely neglected. Now, the level of destruction the Integrity Museum that reopened their doors and have, um, you know, I'm not going to speak of numbers because numbers are, you know, all over the place, but they have um, you know, tragic losses, major losses, but they also have some triumphs. And they have, you know, certain works that are intact and other works that have gone, you know, and will never probably come back. But um, the modern museum, and then uh, there are museums in the provinces as well, and the looting of museums had started from the, you know, during the 1990s, during the Gulf War, so, you know, this is sort of a continuous story. But the, um, uh, the, the Museum of Modern Art was uh, completely looted. The, everything that is in the museum was either taken out or destroyed, broken, you know. Uh, what happened is, um, my, uh, you know, sculpture was, was crushed, but also canvases were cut, either take the canvas or take the wood, um, the frame for wood, and so on. Um, now they claim they, the, the collection had somewhere between uh, 7,500 to 8,500 works. Um, they, no one knows because the archive disappeared as well. And now they, they claim to have about 1,500 works that were recovered. 13 of them, 1,300 of them, we know were in the basement of the Integrity Museum. They later were flooded, and so they were ruined, and they are in, need, in bad need of restoration. There are also many private collections, you know, and there were the works that were in the um, Republican Palace. Many of them I saw in the, U in the U.S., they, they sort of, you know, and there are various uh, uh, military cases about works that were looted or were appropriated, taken by, you know, uh, uh, the, the U.S. military. So we don't have full statistics because no one, you know, seems to care to actually fund this study about that. So we do not know uh, what percentage of the archaeological museum was looted. No, sorry. No, no. Uh, I'm not going to speak about the archaeological museum because that's not really my specialty. I'm a, I'm a historian of modern art. Uh, Professor Spiva, it was his 
Yes, but I don't have a mic. Can I just kind of speak up? Oh, is that a mic? Yeah. Okay. Now, is this uh, just enough? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. You know, I heard Katrin David give what I thought was a really unfortunate talk in Dusseldorf, uh, Stuttgart, sorry, about how she talked about the Gulf, but you, Abu Dhabi, and you work in Doha, about how really the Gulf was clueless that people had moved on from modern art into something else now, and they really wanted these museums of modern art. So it was, to me, it was a very colonial talk. Now, would you like to distinguish between what, in my mind, is the Sykes-Pico area and the Gulf in terms of the relationship to what we call modern art, which is already a historical, I mean, modernism is a historical movement. Would you like to make, because you, you used the collective phrase Arab world, and I'm just wanting you to make, if necessary or if possible, a distinction between this really, I mean, it bordered on contemptuous that they were clueless, they were just building these museums now, whereas people had moved on. And then the idea of you know, Iraq and modern art and so on. Would you like to make a distinction here? Sure. I mean, I can, you know, say a few words about this. Um, I mean, clearly there's this the issue of belatedness that is always a, a, an issue when we talk about modernity in the Arab world or in the non-Western world in general and when we talk about the Gulf specifically. Um, but, you know, and, and to, to clarify also, you know, while uh, modernism is a historical period, but it's not that old in the, you know, the distinction between modernism and postmodernism in uh, the region and in art specifically is, is um, a much more uh, confused, let's say. You know, it's not, there's not, that it happened mostly in the 90s, and that's when actually the Gulf came in. And the institutions of the Gulf, you know, I mean, we look at the history of the Gulf, and regardless of, you know, it, it's, it's, uh, I mean, it's not a matter of being clueless. As a matter of fact, I think there is a new form of Arabness that is being articulated through the Gulf, because they, they advocate themselves in an identity of Arab and, and Islamic, which is funny, because, you know, modern Arab, you know, Arab modernism spent so much energy and time trying to separate Islamic from Arab, and they quickly, you know, and, and you know, a million dollar, uh, put it together in, uh, um, in the same sentence, and try to shape their cities in the same way. And it is, it is still, it's a current you know, situation. Much is happening and much is changing. And Abu Dhabi is very different than Doha. What is interesting and the reason why I am working with Doha is that Madhav, the Arab Museum of Modern Art, is some of these of writing narratives, multiple narratives, as opposed to the simplistic narrative that exists about formation of Arab art, modern Arab art. So, I mean, you know, there, there are various you know, ways to look at how, what, what's happening in the Gulf, and I'm going to leave it at that, sorry. <laughs> You have mentioned um, uh, you had mentioned that the Iraqi artists that had stayed in Iraq were busy with um, identity, with uh, where the artists that had left Iraq uh, passed on to something else. Usually, or often, it's the other way around. Why do you think this is the case for the Iraqi artists? Well, I mean, you know, if we talk about, like, you know, if we think of examples, you know, and, and they were looking at specific works by, you know, uh, Nadine Kuti and, uh, um, um, uh, I can't think of his name now, but, you know, several artists who were living in Scandinavia and they were more concerned with environmental issues, for instance, that to them was like, you know, not, not an issue. They have more, more you know, more uh, pressing points than environment. But, you know, it is, it is the obsession of identity in the sense of preserving it as opposed to uh, you know, presenting it. You know, uh, artists in exile do have a, well, it's kind of interesting because you know, certain generations, they had an obsession of identity and we have styles and movements of, of art even including you, the use of text in, uh, in modern art that was developed in exile mostly and was a, you know, a marker of identity. But then we have the contemporary artists who want to blend in and become you know, artists, global artists. They all want to be identified at least until, before, uh, up until the, before the revolts. 
I mean, the revolts kind of, I think, brought era back in fashion, and I real I noticed that many many of the artists were no longer offended by being labeled Arab artists. They were always and forever labeled labeled as Arab or or Muslim artists in media and judged accordingly, regardless of what the artist thought they were doing or participating in. So it's not a simple. What I'm trying to say here, it's a very complex, you know, sort of web of. of uh, 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 layers of uh, identity understanding and how and what we want to present that. But what is interesting is then the artists who left Iraq after 2003, for a, a long while, they wanted to forget that they were even Iraqi. They really wanted to just move on, make art, do nothing, just blend in, you know, humanity and, you know, just forget. Various re psychological reasons behind that that we can discuss, but, you know, that's the reality. Thank you, Professor Shahoud. Uh, now, with the pressures of time, we are already, you know, we got, I mean, we had, we got 25 minutes late, right? So we are kind of in time. Uh, oh, we're not late for just a moment. Uh, no, we didn't cut you short, right? No, no, I did not cut you short. Uh, now, uh, I guess uh, if there are more questions, Professor Shahoud, you should be kind enough to entertain them uh, after the lectures. But I'd be very now, happy to. Uh, I would like to. Uh, I'll you. Thank you, sister.